Hi guys, this is Jen Curtis, pre and postnatal fitness specialist. Um, in this video, I want to talk about why I don't tell my trainees to contract their pelvic floor um, when they're doing exercises or in general, but specifically when they're when they're doing um, exercises. It's become sort of really trendy and kind of the industry standard to contract your pelvic floor um, when you're doing an exercise. Um, and I've done lots of courses, um, pre and postnatal courses, where um, the um, the the kind of overriding kind of the, the biggest takeaway from the course is this idea of contracting your pelvic floor, and it can become really, really cumbersome. Um, you know, they start cueing the breath and the pelvic floor and the transverse and the like whatever else and it's like um okay and let's do a squat so we're gonna go we're gonna breathe in go down into the squat then you're gonna contract your pelvic floor and you're gonna contract your transverse and you're gonna um and you're gonna breathe out and you know it's like doing like rubbing your tummy and patting your head and it's like a million things all at once um, and quite often there's no actual focus on how, on the technique and how this person's squatting um, uh, in, in uh, they're trying to do all these other things instead and I and I used to coach people that way I used to coach a pelvic floor a cue a pelvic floor contraction and and all these other things and it, it, it I, I found um, uh, I think I found a better way um, and there is there are different schools of thought on this and the old school school of thought is very much kind of like we need to contract the pelvic floor in every single movement um the, that we do and this can become problematic because okay when you're doing squats you can time a contraction every time you um uh, every time you squat and if you're lifting your baby up you can time a pelvic floor contraction every time you lift your baby up and but this starts getting difficult with things like running. When do you time that pelvic floor contraction? What do you do a pelvic floor contraction every single step? It's It starts getting really ridiculous and quite impossible to implement. Um, and I have a few problems with it. Um, and I've, I've been on lots of training courses and on training courses for pelvic floor physios where this discussion comes up and we have this debate about pelvic floor contractions. And it's not something that people have the, the professionals in general or in the industry that we have much consensus on. There's, there's, there are different schools of thought. And I've become more and more influenced by the school of thought that um, I've picked up a lot from um, the pelvic floor physio Sivan Navot here in Israel. And um, she's influenced a lot by um, a French pelvic floor physio called Guillaume. Um, and the, there are other people who talk about a more holistic way, looking at um, the pelvic floor as part of the whole core system. I think most people are talking about that now anyway, um, but integrating it into, um, into how the core works and how we understand that the core works. So it's really important to remember that everyone has a pelvic floor. And when your child, uh, when your five-year-old is running around and lifting things up and climbing up and down things, he's not thinking about, or she's not thinking about, contracting her pelvic floor every time she does something or lifts something up. Um, the pelvic floor should contract um, when we when we do things and when we do when, when we have any sort of exertion. But that doesn't mean that we have to kind of force it um, and, and create this. Um, this this forced um, pelvic floor contraction. What should happen is it should be automated. It should be automated that when I go, let's say I want to just pick up a glass from my cupboard, um, my brain looks at the glass and estimates how much it weighs, um, and there's that goes through the brain and the the brain sends out signals to the pelvic floor and all of my core to stabilize me and compensate. Um, that um, that weight that I'm now lifting up and that could potentially take me off 
balance. And there's going to be an automatic re um, contraction in the pelvic floor and in all the muscles of the core and in the diaphragm um, to kind of stabilize me um, as I lift up this glass. Um, now, if the glass is heavier, I'm going to need a greater contraction as I lift um, as I lift it up. If the glass is filled with water and it's even heavier, then I'd, I'd need a greater su supporting contraction um, to help me cope with that load. And we've all experienced that. That's all autom automatic in our system. And we've all experienced that when we've seen like, I don't know, um, like a, a bottle on the side that's not transparent. Uh, and you go to pick it up and it's actually empty and you sort of like fly up and there's like way too much of a pre-contraction there because we've estimated the wrong weight or like the classic example of lifting up a, um, a suitcase thinking it's full and it's actually empty and you sort of like fly back a little bit. So that pre-contraction should be there to support us and that should be in the pelvic floor as well and obviously well, not necessarily obviously, but we do think that sometimes what happens is we lose that that timing of the system. We lose the timing of the pelvic floor contraction with everything else. And that that's what causes incontinence or pelvic floor dis dysfunction um, or, or prolapse, whatever. Like the, um, it, it's not the cause of it, but it's it can be... Um, it, it, it is something that we find that the timing is wrong in women who have some pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, uh, having said that, um, the aim, I don't, I don't believe the aim isn't to throw in this very voluntary, this very specific um, pelvic floor contraction um, that's kind of very, very isolated from the system. What we want is a kind of is a is is an organic and a and an and a involuntary and an automatic contraction of these muscles to support us and in a fully in a, in a in in someone who has um whose pelvic floor and whose core works like with perfect timing and has has no dysfunction of any kind um, the pelvic floor will never do this kind of forced contraction, maximal contraction, um, where it's just a kind of squeeze of the muscles. Um, the, it will always respond to, it will always be responding to intra-abdominal pressure. So it might look like uh, intra-abdominal pressure increases for whatever reason, because I've lifted up something heavy or because I've made a big like landing and my um, pelvic floor um, will contract uh, kind of iso I isometrically um, against that movement, uh, against that pressure that's down on it, as opposed to this big isotonic um, concentric contraction. Um, so getting, get, on top of that, getting women to contract their pelvic floor, so there's the fact that it's really awkward to time all these different things. I mean, when I lift something up, my multifidus will also contract to support me, especially if I lift it out in front of me. But I don't have to do like this voluntary forced contraction of my multifidus. Um, I don't actually have any control over that. And I shouldn't have to do that with my diaphragm should contract as well with a really heavy load. And I, I don't have to think about that. So why would I have to think about this pelvic floor contraction? Um, so it doesn't match up with what the body does um, uh, um, in a what, what the body's kind of built to do what the, it's not the the strategy in the system what the system is supposed to do um, secondly it's super confusing trying to think about all these different things and the the technique and 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 do the pelvic floor contraction and da 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 da, da. And the third thing is that I just can't know from the outside if she's actually doing that or not. Um, it, it, I can't see it. I can't feel it. I can't um, 
I can't really, my, all I can do is just like assume that that's what she's actually doing. But quite often when they do actually do a pelvic floor contraction, there's this co-contraction of the diaphragm as well. They lock their diaphragm at the same time or they lock their, their transverse at the same time and, and that all increases intra-abdominal pressure and that can put a lot of pressure down on the pelvic floor and that could be making things way worse. The pelvic floor could be bulging out for all I know. Um, so there's there's so many reasons why this doesn't really work and why it doesn't really um it, i don't think it's a useful strategy um what i prefer to do with trainees is to establish good uh breathing mechanics from the outset um i look at how they breathe first of all i assess their breathing um if they have um a very obvious um, issue with their breathing pattern, um, then um, I look at diaphragm function, I look at if they're doing a big chest breath, I look at if they're doing paradoxical breathing. And correcting these things can have a really big impact on how they manage intra-abdominal pressure, how they, um, how they regulate intra-abdominal pressure. Um, sometimes it can help them really relax and, and it really helps them um, uh, get more in tune with, with their body because we take them back into a more natural way of breathing. So I assess the breathing first um, uh, um, by looking at them breathing, by feeling their diaphragm, by looking at, uh, by getting them supine. Um, I'll make another video on, on that whole process, but I want to assess their breathing first of all. Um, and then I want to give them some, um, some ideas about uh, how to, um, uh, and, th and then I want to try to uh, to correct their breathing if there are any major issues. If there are small issues, sometimes you can just kind of uh, improve the breathing mechanics a little bit. Um, and if there are really big issues like locking the diaphragm, you can start to try and release the diaphragm and reduce intra-abdominal pressure that way. Um, and once we've got those, a better breathing pattern set up, which isn't usually particularly hard to do because the body wants to get back into that pattern because that's, that's how the body's supposed to breathe. If you look at a baby breathing or a dog breathing, they, they have, this, um, they have this, these, these very natural breathing mechanics already set up. Um, so the body wants to get back into that. So it's not usually very difficult to establish um, those, breath those, those good breathing mechanics. Um, um, and then that will trickle down into how she breathes when she's going about her daily life or when she's lifting something heavy or when she's doing exercise. Um, and we keep coming back to the breath and we keep checking that it's, um, that it, that it is, uh, that, that she's still able to access that, those, those good breathing mechanics and, um, and, and, it, and improve them. And in some of my clients, I use a, um, a breathing, uh, technique called Guillaume, um, which I just found a really great way of strengthening that physiological um, breathing, um, that, that, that physiological uh, mechanism and improving those breathing mechanics and strengthening um, the different members of the core um, and uh, within their physiological role. So if we've got that nice I'm looking at someone who's supine, right? So we've got this nice descent of the, the, the diaphragm, the pelvic floor, and this expansion of the abdomen, and then a recoil back to the norm. What Guillaume does is it's basically just a mouthpiece with like adjustable resistance, where you can add resistance, and so you make it harder for that pelvic floor and for the core to, for the, for the abdominal muscles to recoil back into their position. Um, and uh, gradually you can increase that resistance and just make that system and make that mechanism stronger and stronger and stronger. So that's sometimes appropriate for some of my clients. I don't use it with everyone, um, uh, but it can really help with um, releasing a, um, 
a, a tight diaphragm and, and, and reinforcing and strengthening those uh, good breathing mechanics. Now, sometimes we set up this really great breathing mechanic, this, this really great breathing mechanism. We get someone breathing really well with all of their, all of the members of their, of their core. Sorry, my dog's tail's just going crazy on there, <laughs> knocking the camera. So, Sometimes we um, we get this really great breathe the, these great breathing mechanics going uh, just using the breath, um, and then as soon as you give them a dumbbell, get them to do any exercise, they press down with their diaphragm, um, and so I try to incorporate awareness of the diaphragm and release of the diaphragm in different movements, even if it's. You know, they might be doing a floor press with 10 kilos, um, but they can't, we have to go all the way down to just doing the movement with no weight in order for them to not do that compensation and, um, and compensate with the diaphragm to increase intra-abdominal pressure. So um, we'll play around with, um, with uh, the, the, uh, with the diaphragm within just, just breathing and then we'll, we can create more resistance and create more difficulty through either something like the Gyeong method where you have a adjustable mouthpiece or through um, different doing different exercises um, and then we can incorporate it into more and more exercises and the the um, we want to set up that that what what Julie Weeb refers to as the piston breath um, so I, I want to work with, um, with the breath and with the physiological, um, with the physiological um, function of the pelvic floor to support our pelvic organs um, rather than, um, rather than uh, just doing this forced um, uh, pelvic floor contraction that doesn't work with other muscles um, at the same time. So um, I hope that makes sense. Um, it's uh, it's a really big topic, and um, and it's something that a lot of people within the fitness industry, within pre and postnatal care, don't really agree about themselves or amongst themselves. So it can be a really confusing topic. Um, but as professionals, we have to kind of decide um, at some point what sounds like the most um, logical uh, way of moving forward on this particular topic, what the what, what school of thought it is that we kind of subscribe to. And um, this makes an awful lot of sense to me and the, um, the more I learn about using the breath um, and balancing the core um, in this kind of way, um, the more I feel that like the, the, the pelvic floor contractions just don't work um, in real time and in the context of uh, people actually doing things and actually learning how to automate the contraction of their pelvic floor, which is what should always be the goal. Um, so let me know if you have any questions, if you agree or disagree, and um, um, I hope this was a useful, um, if not clear, uh, video on the topic.